Welcome to the penultimate uh, event of this literary weekend. Um, we probably don't need to introduce Jock Sarong to most people here. Okay, <laughs> Jock Sarong on the right. <laughs> um, he's got an event after this at 5.30, uh, launching Burning Island for a second time <laughs> this weekend. <laughs> then we have Nicole Kelly and Michelle Scott Tucker. And thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone and um, thank you very much for coming along. Um, we've got two really brilliant pieces of historical writing to talk about this afternoon. Nicole's Lament about Ned and the gang and Michelle's A Life at the Edge of the World about Elizabeth MacArthur. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about each of our guests, um, Nicole has lived as variously as, I look this up, Northern Scotland and the Mallee. And it's all over. <laughs> and are you currently in, did you say Ballarat? So uh, just up from Ballarat in yep. Beaufort. Right, okay, yep, yep. Um, you describe yourself as teacher, writer, mother and wife. Yes, all rounder. And things I, <laughs> things I figured out by snooping are that you and I are also um, Collingwood tragics. Oh, can't oh, really? even talk about it. Uh, <laughs> yep. You were very nice How about long bucks. How does talk go for? <laughs> <laughs> um, and perhaps long-suffering owners of guinea pigs. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, but okay. yes have a tendency to eat strange things and I just think, please don't die. <laughs> yeah, don't die. Every frosty morning, are they frozen? Yeah. No, they're not frozen. Yeah. Okay. Um, you wrote your first manuscript as a 15-year-old? Oh, yes. That's extraordinary. Terrible, terrible, horrible thing that's tucked away somewhere. But uh, it was called Skeleton in the Closet. It right. ended up with a skeleton in the closet. So I wasn't, you know. It was how, uh, how long was it? Oh, a couple hundred pages. Gosh. Yes. Okay. At 15? Wow. Yes, yeah. Good Lord. But yeah, no one ever saw it, so it doesn't really care. <laughs> um, and, and we need to do an important piece of disambiguation. Kelly? I'm actually not related. No, right. no, there is no relation. I married a Kelly. Uh, right. So, yes, that's my claim to fame. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, but it's another good reason that people will pick up the book. Yeah. When they see it. yeah. I wonder what went on there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, Michelle, your Twitter handle describes you as biographer and ghost. Yes. And I'm embarrassed by how long it took me to understand what you were referring to. I'm working, I'm ghostwriting a memoir, yes. even as we speak. Right. So. Is that the, the sort of accepted industry term for a ghostwriter, that the shorthand is ghost? I think so, right. but I'm not sure. I just think it sounds cool. So. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I've seen it used as a verb, that, that you ghosted something. Yes. Um, but you appear to be in... corporeal. Yes, <laughs> yeah. for today. Good. <laughs> yes. Um, and you are, of course, the author of Elizabeth MacArthur, uh, A Life at the Edge of the World, which is 2018, yeah, I think. That's right. um, and then you have a co written project coming up. Yes, which is the work I'm ghostwriting. I'm uh, writing a memoir for a businessman. He's an actor, he's got his own film and television company. Um, he's a professional, been a professional footballer, a community health worker, a King's Cross bouncer, um, and he's a Torres Strait Islander. So it's a story about him and about his community, and it's it's a joy to write, and that'll be out early next, uh, late next year. Um, and can you tell us just a little bit about how the relationship works between ghost and subject? I couldn't tell you generally how yep. it works. For me, it works. I write, and he goes, "Yeah, I really like it." <laughs> <laughs> and I go, "Dude, have you read it?" I've looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's different. <laughs> and so he's um, he's actually reading it even as we speak and texting me in live time about how it's going like right now. There was a pretty marvellous exchange. Making. We were just down at Bank & Co and you were receiving live texts while we were talking <laughs> That's from right. your subject. And what, what was the classic line we got? Oh, f it, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Queenslander. <laughs> um, turning to the matter at hand, and I think we should start with you, Michelle. Um, you refer somewhere to Elizabeth MacArthur as, um, or, or this book, I should say, as a fascinating biography of a woman who established of the woman who established the Australian wool industry, brackets, although her husband received all the credit. Yes. <laughs> um, why don't we know more about Elizabeth MacArthur and why should we? I can't really say why we don't accept the patriarchy, really. Um, those of you who are old enough to remember the $2 note will remember there used to be a sheep on it and John MacArthur's face, and that's Elizabeth's husband, and, and he got the credit for establishing the Australian wool industry. But she arrived in Australia in 1790. She died in 1850. And for those 60 years, she knew all the governors. She was a friend of Matthew Flinders. She was involved in the um, military coup against Bligh. 
when um, Charles Darwin came to Sydney, he had lunch with the MacArthurs. Leichhardt, the explorer, would pop in to see her. She knew everyone. She was a political player. She was a businesswoman in her own right, and yet her husband got all the credit. And so this is an attempt to lift her up into the light, and in so doing, lift up into the light why women have been written out of history um, throughout Australian historical record. Do you think I had a sense reading your book that um, she also she was clearly the hub of a social circle, mm -hmm. and that maybe she was consciously gathering women around her to get things done. It was more than simply having tea. It, it definitely was. There were so few women of her class in the colony to begin with um, that she often complained of being lonely and there were other women in the colony but the class structure was such that she couldn't possibly have friendships with women who weren't of her class so there was a small coterie for her to, to work with anyway but I think they all used whatever means they could to get things done and, and to make things happen while having gazillions of children <laughs> and so they were constantly multitasking. Um, you have a really good piece on your website about the genesis of this book, which is called Never Just a Farmer's Wife. Yeah. And in it, you talk about teamwork. And, and I had said to you earlier, a mistake that I've definitely made um, with male farming mates, that you sometimes refer to it as his farm, mm. and you very quickly get corrected. This is our farm, and it's actually a team endeavour. That's right. Um, so, so can you explain how that thinking led into the book? Yeah, so in my 20s I, I worked for government and I managed a grant program and I was working with women um, in outback Queensland helping them to develop telecommunications grants. And they were from near long reach, <laughs> when I say near, not near. <laughs> um, and they impressed upon me that they weren't farmers' wives, that they were farmers in their own right and that their economic contribution to the family farm was just as crucial as the contribution of their husbands, even though the work was often split but not always split along gendered lines. And that was like a little light bulb moment for me. It shouldn't have been, but it was. And I wondered why I'd always thought of an Australian farmer as a man in a hat instead of being you know, a woman and a man in a hat. And so just out of interest, I went back and looked at, tried to find out more about Australian women farmers and found out there's heaps of them. There's heaps of them. Um, they're a large minority always of, of the colonial farming community. And so Elizabeth's was one of the first stories that I came across and I sort of just disappeared down the rabbit hole of, of Elizabeth MacArthur, really. But that whole women, Australian women farmers um, became really close to my heart and the issue of lifting them up into the light as well. And in that essay, you go through a whole lot of examples of other historically significant female farmers in Australia. That's right. So there, there's a woman who walked around Saxony for two years collecting sheep as she went. Um, brought them all over to Tasmania and she established the wool industry in Tasmania and brought her family over. Um, and at the time, at Elizabeth's time in the historical record, women farmers get mentioned all the time. Sometimes they're the wives of soldiers who are off doing other things. Sometimes they're widows who've been left with the farm. Sometimes they're just married women whose husband does something and they do something else. But they're there. So why aren't they what we talk about when we talk about farmers? There's been a deliberate effort Deliberate? I don't know. There's some effort there to, to remove them from the historical record, from the myth-making that Don was talking about last night, the myth that Lawson and his ilk created of the lone man, the lone white man, against the frontier, when in fact it was usually a man and his family against the frontier. And the, Austra the US myth has that. You think of the covered wagons travelling out west and they're full of families travelling out west. But in Australia it's all one white man going out by himself to usually die a horrible death. <laughs> um, my reading of your book was that there were two crucial absences when Elizabeth actually got the chance to come out of the shadow. So if they arrived in 1790, um, MacArthur takes off in 1801 for a year or two, and then he takes off in 1809 for a long time. Yeah. And during those periods, partially she's forced by circumstance, but she gets the opportunity to get out from the shadow of this ridiculous man, frankly. That's right. So he was gone for four years and then he was gone for eight years. So for a 12-year period when she was in her, in her prime, in her 30s and 40s, she was running the place on her own, um, running multiple properties over thousands of acres, plus their other businesses. They had ships, they had retail businesses going, they diversified. Um, 
often you'll see it as the sheep being inevitable and their inevitable means to wealth, but in fact that was just one of many different business enterprises they had and the sheep just happened to take off. So, yes, yeah, she was on her own for 12 years running the family farms, but always with small children at foot. She always had what we would now call primary age children or younger, um, sometimes a baby in arms, when her husband's just pissed off to the, <laughs> gone off to England again, see ya, and left her behind to, to do it all on her own. And, and I think we were talking about this, she should be an Australian name that's up there with Ned Kelly and Burke and Wills and, and that whole Anzac mythology, and she's not. And I think we need to think about why she's not. And one of the things that um, characterises the book is that every chapter or two, John's fighting another duel with pistols. Yes. And Elizabeth is pregnant again. Yeah. It's like it punctuates the entire tale. That's right. So John's an idiot. <laughs> and, and he keeps putting himself at risk. He literally fights duels, pistols at dawn, the whole thing, without thinking about what the implications will be if he dies. And she's left without a breadwinner. And, and often she is pregnant when this is the case. Like, are you just thinking, seriously, dude? Are you not just thinking this through? Um, when he overthrew the Bly government, the Rum Rebellion, you might have learned about that at school. What you won't have learned is that Elizabeth at that time was four or five months pregnant. And he's putting his head in a treasonous noose, basically. By overthrowing the government, he's putting himself at risk. And he's, he does that throughout his whole life. He just takes these risks and completely foregoes his family's safety in, in doing so. So she's having to manage all that as she goes along as well. Um, to change direction, Nicole, you, from going through um, literal history telling, you've done something very, very different with the Kelly story. Can you tell us what it is? Yeah, so um, it's a what if story. So what if uh, the siege at Glenrowan had gone the way they wanted it to go? Had the train derailed? What would have happened next with the Kelly story? Uh, and so that was kind of the idea behind it. And so when I've written it, we started on the, I started on the night of the siege and have sort of branched off at that section of into what could have happened. But it's kind of woven, not as beautifully researched as <laughs> Michelle's book. I wrote the, the draft first with um, the knowledge that I already had. I grew up in the Northeast. So everybody in the Northeast has a Kelly story. Everybody grandmother lent a horse to the Kellys at some stage and it got returned. Uh, so there's already that kind of knowledge just across the town. So I wrote that um, and then I went back and researched on top of it. And so things like events that happened in other parts, I come from Ballarat or near Ballarat and things like there was a, a giant ram sale that happened near Ballarat in 1880, which had the siege gone the way it should have gone or they wanted it to go. Um, maybe they ended up in Ballarat, Gold Town, giant ram sales, lots of money. Um, we had royalty down in Ballarat and all of those events actually happened. So it was kind of this weaving of um, research and, and fact along with the fictional aspect of it as well. Now, all of the, the Kelly nuts as we speak are maintaining a candlelit <laughs> vigil today. Um, can you explain to us why? Yes, so tomorrow, tomorrow the 28th, um, it is the 27th today, isn't it? Yep. Yes, yes. So the 28th tomorrow is the 141st anniversary of the siege. Um, so I guess 141 years ago today, the boys were holed up in the Glenrowan Inn. So it was quite interesting when I realised that that was going to coincide with our dates, that 140 years later, we are still talking about the Kellys and what went down and what could have happened. This is like a slightly weird version of Christmas. Obviously something happens tonight, does it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, early hours of the morning. So yes, yeah. And then um, tomorrow is when he was captured 141 years ago. Uh, so being in the inn, it was sort of more of a, a jovial atmosphere. So they collected people as they went along through the day. Um, and so it ended up with half the township there. So in Glenrowan, I'm not sure if you know Glenrowan, there's a big railway track that runs through the middle and on one side was uh, the Jones Inn, and on the other side was the McDonald's, ta McDonald's Tavern. Uh, and they all hold up in the Jones Inn and they just kept collecting people on the way. So school teachers <laughs> and random people that just kept driving and they said, well, you can't go anywhere because we're kind of going to do something down at the train track. And so he stayed. But by the end of it, by that night, by tonight, 141 years ago, it was quite a party atmosphere. People were singing. And Jones, the son, was standing singing. Uh, he was 13. And singing ballads at the piano and there was dancing and um, a celebratory atmosphere for something when in history we now look back that was completely tragic. Mm -hmm. 
in lots of civilians were injured and there were civilians killed. Anne Jones lost her son. So um, we look back at it in history. But at the time, I feel like there was this real feeling of hope about what was going to happen for them. They didn't see that as their demise mm. was about to take place. Um, this is These events are significant Australian history. And, and it's obvious that it would be thought about and written about and that it would be a part of our national story. But the Kelly thing transcends that. People are very, very personally invested about the Kellys even now. Yeah. Now, you've obviously looked closely at this. Do you know why? I'm not sure I know why, um, but people are incredibly, incredibly um, opinionated mm. one way or the other about it. Uh, and when I wrote it, I, I didn't ever think it would be published because I thought there is so much Kelly. Yeah literature out there there's surely not any more room for anything else I thought I'll just tuck it under and tell the kids I wrote a book one day and um, but by doing that I've been able to now meet lots of Kelly relatives and heart relatives and being able to speak to people that know them intimately but even the people that don't know them intimately there's just this feeling of that they do know it is an Australian story and particularly a Victorian story I feel of the Kellys and so I'm not sure it's bigger than just a bush ranger. That's why he's bigger than a bush ranger. It's that idea of, and what I tried to write into Lament was that they were young. They were so young. And we look at some of the boys that are yahooing down the pub at, you know, 20 and late teens and think, gosh, you know, they're not far removed. 140 years ago isn't that far away from, from today. And that, that feeling of they're invincible and, you know, they're idealistic and they're, they're feeling like they need to um, justice for their family. And for me, Ned, my Ned, is um, family is everything for him and that what is what drove him. And I feel that it wasn't a bloodthirsty thing of we're going to rip up the tracks and derail the train and it was for family. It was for that feeling of um, we're going we're gonna to get hostages and we're going to get our mother out of jail because, you know, it's just not fair that she's in there and it's this feeling of we're we going to avenge her and... Um, I think we were speaking earlier about the death of Aaron Sherratt, um, and who was potentially going to be the fifth member of the Kelly gang, for them to, in cold-blooded murder, shoot him on his doorstep. I mean, it's just the most cold-blooded thing you could imagine. But they've done it from a sense of loyalty to each other, that he was disloyal to that brotherhood of, of them and he was putting them all at stake. We know now that he, he actually wasn't. He was doing it um, in order to help help Joe, who was his best friend, I guess. And uh, But it's that feeling of loyalty, of family that I think drives him. And I feel that that's part of unlocking why we still talk about him today, because it's not black and white. It's not he was doing it for money. It's not he was doing it to murder people and be... It was coming from a different point of, of view, of loyalty. So the great, um, the great tool that's available to you writing speculation about the Kellys is that you can get inside Ned's head and you can write inside Ned's tin can and you can <laughs> you can write in Ned's voice in the first person. Mm. And all of a sudden, my only understanding as a reader of who he was is the Gerildery letter, which is quite bombastic <laughs> and, and quite dramatic and, and mm. formal in parts. And here's you, um, it's very intimate. You, you, we're seeing his worries mm. and his loves. We're seeing at one stage, he's very concerned that he's lost his authority over the gang. And he thinks, God, if, if they're not going to believe me and follow me, I'm in real trouble here. And and that's the great availability for you, isn't it, writing it that way? Yeah, being in his head. I, I said to um, Michelle and Jock earlier that it's it didn't start off being from Ned's point of view. It was from uh, multiple points of view. So there's about five characters. I wrote a little bit from Ned, a little bit from Etty, who is his love interest, who is Eddie Hart, Steve's sister, um, and Joe Byrne. And so I wrote from all these different characters. And when I gave it to an editor she said it, it doesn't work it needs to be why why did you do it and my re reaction was I don't know it was just easier <laughs> it's too hard to write it all from Ned's point of view but then going back and rewriting it from his point of view it was being able to get in his head and think about no person I feel that no matter whether they're good bad or indifferent has absolute conviction in what they're doing on the day you might have absolute conviction but you know, maybe things didn't quite go to plan or maybe you're thinking ahead. And, and so for him, having those really human feelings of um, doubting himself, doubting, you know, whether the ending was going to be how he wanted it, but then externally having that persona of, you know, I am the leader 
you know, there's, I, I like the dynamics between he and Dan, um, the brothers, where I feel like in, in the actual siege, he went back um, to get Dan, you know, Dan and Steve were still in there and Joe, I got sorry, John, they were still in the inn and so he's gone back, he's, he's managed to get away and he's come back into the fight uh, for Dan and yet I just feel that there would have been this absolute tension between these two family members of um, Ned having to have the authority. He had to have the authority in that relationship and Dan always living in his shadow. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure that answered the question. <laughs> Actually, I went off on a tangent. <laughs> um, one of the things that both of you have had to contend with in writing about real historical people is the relationship between your project and an existing body of work. Mm. Um, Michelle, in fact, in your case, it's not an existing body of work, it's something that came afterwards, and that's Kate Grenville's book. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that went and, and also what came before your book? Sure. So I, my book came out in 2018. Um, it all was a great deal of fun. In 2020, Kate Grenville gave me a phone call. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and she took me out for coffee and she was delightful. And she spoke to me about this book and was basically trying very hard to, to get me on side. And, and we had a, a terrific talk about it and, and talked about all different things. And, and, I, and I wished her well with it because she was writing fiction and she'd taken Elizabeth as a character and, and carried her forward and I'd written non-fiction and that was fine. And Kate's book came out and it's, you know, it's written by Kate Grenville. It's beautiful. It's beautifully written. Um, her Elizabeth is not my Elizabeth. And, and we tell quite different stories. And, and in a sense, I've... I've some people have said to me, well, I've read Kate's book and then they've gone back to mine to find out the true story, whatever that means, or, or, or just wanted to know more about Elizabeth and done that. So the two um, are complementary, I think. But the book that got me into Elizabeth was one that was published in 1980, um, and it was a biography of its time. So at that time, that's five years after, Anne Summers wrote um, Damned Whores and God's Police, so there was more biographies coming out about Australian women, so this was part of that process. But it's a very traditional biography of mm. the woman on a pedestal help meet to her fabulous husband. Um, and I read that, and it's beautifully researched, but I read that and I thought for the first time ever in reading a book, I thought I could tell that story better. There, there's some things in there I don't think she's got it quite right. And one of the key things was that and, and I'm glad you're sitting down because this is shocking, but Elizabeth and John got married and five months later there was a bonnie baby boy. I know, I know, it's terrible. But <laughs> in that original biography she was going, oh, no one would have batted an eyelid. And I'm thinking, well, hang on, I've read Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> I think they would have. <laughs> I remember what happened to Lydia and how horrified everyone was when she ran off with Wickham. I think having a baby five months after the wedding, the town's going to be counting back on their fingers. And so that made me think I could tell that story and tell it as a compelling story. And I think the fact of having that baby that was big for dates was one of the reasons <laughs> that she came to Australia because she was the first officer's wife to come out. No one else, none of the other officers had brought their wives. She was the first woman of her class and social standing to come out to Australia. And I think that baby was, was part of the reason for that. That's my speculation, but I think it was. So that original 1980 biography has had this huge flow-on effect for me, not least because I could use it to find where the, all the primary sources were because someone had already <laughs> gone before me. So I think it's lovely that there are multiple stories of important people. There's multiple biographies of Dickens, for instance, and no one bats an eyelid at that, and, and multiple stories about Ned Kelly. It's great to have those different perspectives because what is the true story? Who would know? And in fact, you're now, in a sense, you're in on the ground floor of building a literary tradition around Elizabeth. Yeah. I, I think so. And, and Kate Grenville will, will carry it on and, and carry it forward. And now we're friends because we had coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nicole, in your case, I was thinking when I read your book about the various interpretations of the Kelly myth. Yes. And I had sketched out this list, which was Peter Carey, Robert Drew, Paul Kelly, Heath Ledger, Mick mm -hmm. Jagger, Justin Curzell. And I looked at the list and I thought, hang on, they're all blokes. Um, are you as far as you know, the first woman to interpret the Kelly myth in this way? I don't know. I don't know if I'm the first woman, but I haven't read any other women kind of perspectives on it. Um, I had said I'd done a lot of research through Ian Jones, and so I was a history nerd at school. 
I am still am history nerd, let's be honest. We're um, in good company here. <laughs> history, um, history at uni and, and so that Australian history. Doing the non-fiction, I read a lot of non-fiction about him. I didn't read fictional Kelly things, really. Um, and I did have to admit that I've never read Peter Carey's amazing award-winning book and I have never read it and I was too scared then to read it while I was writing it because I didn't want anything to kind of um, after having this idea for it. So um, I've never read it, but I will get around to reading it once this is all done. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure, but I did think that they may be off-putting for people. So the fact that it's first-person um, narration, I did have quite a few people say, oh, I find it hard to read first-person. And um, actually, when I sent it out to some beta readers and they were lovely, and um, originally they said, oh, I, I landed... I started off reading it thinking, okay, you're a woman writing in from his perspective, but I lost that quickly. And I thought, well, that's good because I, I didn't want to be heard through there. I want to be invisible in the, in the back of the book. Is it possible that all of these men writing about and making film about Kelly, blokes piling on blokes, piling on blokes, that Kelly and his story were being driven into this kind of white patriarchal corner yeah, I think and I, that you in yeah. some way are pulling him back out? Uh, I hope so. I hope that when that people read it, we talk about hidden women mm. and the story when I originally wrote it from the different perspectives, Eddie had a really big part in it. Eddie Hart had a really big part and so did Kate Kelly in it. And um, sadly, Kate's voice had to leave it when I um, when I rewrote it. But Etty still has a really strong part in it. And I hope that as a woman, I've brought the strength of the women in his story to the front as well. So that she, his whole need to escape really is for her. Um, and that she's, you know, she's smart. She has ideas and she's the one that comes up with the idea, hey, let's go to Ballarat. Um, when they're all, you know, sitting there twiddling their thumbs, wondering who they're going to kill next kind of thing. Not that simplistically, but I hope that I've brought some sensitivity to um, women like Anne Jones, who incredibly strong woman, like in history, she ran the inn on her own when, you know, her husband was working for the railways. She ended up spending time in jail afterwards. So on the day um, Ned Kelly was actually hung, a warrant for her arrest was sent out um, for harbouring outlaws and I think oh my goodness they landed in her inn how cruel you know she lost children from the siege itself and afterwards and slightly before she had a very tragic um, life with her kids dying and I think so bringing out their stories and seeing their strength through it I feel like perhaps um, was something that I was able to bring to it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, did I read correctly in Lament that the 13 year old boy you were talking about singing was one of the casualties? Yeah, so that was um, Ann Jones's son. So he um, was singing, and that's a true story, he was singing a ballad, a Kelly ballad, and um, he was shot. Yeah, he was one of the actual. Um, her daughter Jane died not long after it. She was injured at the siege and she died a couple of years afterwards, I think. Um, and she had a daughter that died six months previous to the siege. Um, in a, a tree fell in their backyard as they're felling a tree. So, I mean, tragic, so tragic. And yet she just continued on, continued on. And um, which women in history do that same. And do you think perhaps that, that in our over-focus on um, the great drama and daring of the Kelly myth, these are exactly the details that have been missed along the way? People like Jones and her family? I think there's lots more stories in there. When I wrote this and I thought, oh gosh, how many more Kelly stories you can have? And the more I've read and the more I've researched and the more I've written, I just think, oh, there are more stories there. Maybe not for me <laughs> to tell, but there are more stories there to be told. And lots of those are the women. And, you know, we've seen Kate Kelly book just released recently. And um, there are definitely more stories there to be told of the women in there. Um, I think for... Ned, I mean, this is undoubtedly Ned's story, but Ned's story is just so interwoven with the women in his family, his very strong mother and his sisters and um, his love interest, whoever that might be. Yeah. Um, Michelle, I, uh, th there's a marvellous piece of innuendo in your book <laughs> that I, I may have read too much into this, but um, it's the fact that both you and Kate Grenville pick up on the same small line that gets me guessing and that is that at one stage in uh, in correspondence, I think, Elizabeth mm. writes of her um, friendship and a particular social occasion with Dawes, who was a lieutenant. Le and he was a lieutenant. He was an astronomer. He had his own little shack a couple of kilometres out of where the base of Sydney Harbour is, uh, where the base of the Sydney Harbour Bridge is now, yep. when the rest of Sydney was more around um, where the tank stream came out. So he was teaching her astronomy because um, she was bored 
bought out of her teaching skull. her astronomy. Yeah, teaching her astronomy. <laughs> Apparently, that has to happen at night. Um, and and so and she um, writes to a friend how she had to stop having the lessons, and she says it's because she was too dumb to work it out. But um, she says, "I blush at my error." And, and I think she hadn't thought that through, that she was spending time with a lieutenant at night in this tiny little camp where everyone's talking about each other because it's this little closed community. Did they have an affair or not? Well, Kate Grenville says yes and, and carries that forward. I don't know. And so I just leave the reader to make their own assumptions about that. And that's the wonderful difference between non-fiction and fiction. With fiction, you can take those wonderings and turn them into something magical and, and interesting. In non-fiction, I just had to leave the space and the, give the information to the reader and then leave it up to you to decide what happened and to imagine it yourself. And look, to be fair, I framed it in such a way that you would assume that they had an affair without actually <laughs> saying that. But then it's up to you to decide and to use your imagination because if you've got fact A and fact B, you're as qualified to decide what happened in between those two facts as anyone. Um, and so it's about giving the reader the information and then leaving them to make their own assumptions. Fiction writers may help you to carry that story forward and I think that's beautiful. Now, I'm choosing, being equipped with fact A and fact B, I'm choosing to take a salacious view of this. Yes. <laughs> He's, John's away for a total of 13 years yeah. in the prime of Elizabeth's life. Yeah. Do all of the conception dates stack up? <laughs> I checked them very carefully, yeah. yes, because I did, I did wonder that. Yeah. And I would have loved to have found evidence of her having a scurrilous affair. I would have loved to have found that. <laughs> found that. I, I hope she did. <laughs> but there is no primary evidence to, to say that. And why would there be? Because she's a smart woman. If she had one, she'd keep that on the down low. Um, and also all the primary evidence we have for her are mainly her letters, which have been curated by her children mm -hmm. um, and often transcribed by her children. And they haven't told us what they left out or what they burnt or what's still hidden in the attic down at Camden Park. Um, so primary sources are a thing. And, and yes, I did a lot of research, mainly out of terror, because I'm not a historian, so I just wanted to make sure that it was right. But you know yourself, you write a letter to your mum and you say one thing and you write a letter to your friend and you say something completely different about the same thing. So primary sources aren't always all they're cracked oh, up to so be. So much room for interpretations. Like, sorry Absolutely. to interrupt, so much room yeah. for interpretations. So Eddie Hart is the woman that, in my story, that Ned has his love interest with. And one of her great-grandsons, great-great-grandsons, um, has written a book about the girl that Ned Kelly loved, about Eddie Hart, and um, which I stumbled across mm. when I was researching. And so he's got some of her diaries and put that forward as his, you know, his truth of what happened and that she um, was his love. Um, and then the flip side of that is, you know, they're a family. I went and ha was able to have coffee with one of the, she's a Kelly and Hart relative and she's beautiful and so knowledgeable about their family. Um, and I said, oh, I've just, you know, I'm so in love with the fact that Eddie might have actually been with Ned. And she said, no, no, just like, just quashed it. <laughs> and so there doesn't matter that, that source of, information that they have the same family information there and, and it's completely different. So there's so much interpretation from everybody. Exactly. And it's amazing that that, that period of outlawry, was, as you say, was only 18 months yes. and it's 141 years ago yes. and people are still interpreting it. Yes. Um, but the, the thing that both of your books reminded me about um, correspondence back in that era, that it functions very much like social media does now in the sense that people, as you just said, Michelle, people were attempting to curate others' impressions of them. Yes. So they were, they were trying to project various versions of themselves via what they depicted. And yes. it's really clear with Elizabeth, isn't it? it? It really is. So she was writing letters home to her mother and home to her best friend um, back in England. And, it, and some of those letters we have, she's writing about the same event. So she says to her mother, Oh, a, a lieutenant's just come back from what we now call Indonesia and I was able to buy some things from, from him at, at very reasonable prices. You know, good one, Mum. And at the same time, she writes to her best friend and says, um, lieutenant's come back from Indonesia and, and he gave me some wonderful gifts. <laughs> <laughs> now, the mum and the friend knew each other, so I don't know how she was going to think that they didn't, wouldn't read each other's letters. But in that, it was evident that she was writing to quite different audiences. And again, that her letters might not be entirely reliable witnesses to what was actually going on. Um, there's a photo in your book of Elizabeth Farm. Yes. So what, what is its modern 
um, iteration. I is it uh, a shrine to Elizabeth and to John? No, I, I, I um, had to go to England for work and I, I took a week off and went on a trip to the village where she's from, which is called Bridge Rural. It's in North Devon. So in England, they call it remote. <laughs> um, right on the border of Devon and Cornwall and I spent two days there and there was a woman there who writes the village newsletter. I was all a bit vicar of Dibley and, I, and I, she'd invited me over for morning tea and we ended up getting on like a house on fire and we spent two days together and she showed me all around the village and introduced me to people. And the farm where Elizabeth was born is a working farm still. It's, it's still on 100 acres. It's set near the village but on a hill with a river um, frontage around it. And the people in the farm took me in, um, gave me afternoon tea, a Devonshire tea, as it happened, a really, really good one. Um, and they were just lovely. It's a working farm. But in going there in person and seeing that, it made me realise that the setup where Elizabeth lives in Australia, which is called Elizabeth Farm, which is open to the public and is kind of a shrine to Elizabeth, it's in Parramatta, it's the same. It's a farm on a hill above the river. It's got plenty of river frontage. It's set on a little rise. It's right near the village of what was then Parramatta, like five minutes walk away. She's recreated in Elizabeth Farm in Parramatta, the farm she grew up in in Devon. And you couldn't know that unless you went there and actually saw it and walked around it. And, and that was a real eye opener for me. It was, it was new and interesting information that other historians hadn't picked up on. There was, there's one stark difference for me, which was that you talk about the MacArthur's having buried Aboriginal people in their front garden. Yeah. Are those graves still there? I don't know. Um, I think people do know where they are. And, and Elizabeth Farm now is only on a couple of acres um, and the rest of it is housing that's been built around Deep it. Degree. Yeah. So so the, the boundaries of the, the, the um, countryside have shifted. But Elizabeth's relationship with the local um, Indigenous people was really interesting because it wasn't initially confrontational. Um, and it was a mutual relationship. I'm not saying it was an equal relationship. I think her views of them were, were always fairly patronising. But they had Indigenous people live with them. They had in, in, young people live with them. Um, Indigenous people went out of their way to help her and vice versa. And, and there was a ritual spearing ceremony that was, was held just in front of her household. And her son remembers watching it. The, the guy who got speared got killed and I think that was by accident and then Elizabeth had him nursed for a week until he died and then he asked to be buried within sight of the house. Now we might say here's the interpretation part why did he ask to be buried within sight of the house? Is that because of his respect for the MacArthur's or is it that because this is his country and the MacArthur's have chosen a place to build their house that was important to him in a spiritual sense before they ever turned up anyway? Yeah. We can't know that sort of information. And again, you're very neutral about pointing out that the historical record says that he was buried facing the house. Yeah. And, and that can either be read as, as you say, enormous respect for the house and the householders or something entirely unrelated that we can't see. That's right. And, and those gaps I find are endlessly interesting, but I've left them as gaps for us to think about and, and to say there's things we can't know and, and there's always things we can't know and that's okay. <laughs> Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about villainy and, and Nicole, you touched on this before when you were talking about Aaron Sherritt, that the execution of Aaron Sherritt is really shocking mm -hmm. and that the spins that you can put on that are almost endless. Um, mm -hmm. This idea that Aaron was leaking information because he was trying to protect Joe, Joe felt his loyalty to Ned and the gang that he needed to stop that leak. Um, the derailing of the, of the police train didn't happen but had it happened yeah. as you speculate it could have been mass murder mm -hmm. and and yet somehow we keep coming back to the notion that ned and the gang were good old boys and that people like sherrit and indeed kerno the teacher were the bad guys mm -hmm. have we just got it all wrong i don't know that's a huge question um i don't know about getting it all wrong i think it comes like we spoke about earlier it comes back to the fact that ned and the boys were not initially i feel I'm completely wrong, I'm no expert, um, that they're not, they weren't bloodthirsty, you know, that they were making decisions on the run for what they thought was loyalty for the right reasons. And, um, you know, Aaron Sherrod, they thought that he was their best friend. He thought they were going to be that fifth member and then to, to realise that he was actually, you know, working with the police against them, like the ultimate betrayal of them, that you can 
almost not excuse it but you can almost see the reason behind it you can see why that happened and why that decision was made and then the fact that they knew that that killing would bring the police heading up to the northeast it's you know you couldn't have written a, a better a better story really the actual story itself which is what we spoke about about truth being stranger than fiction i mean you can have all these the best story in the world that you've written but actually the factual elements of it are the most interesting the most humorous the most amazing and the fiction just kind of wove them all in together i mean um it's off the topic a little bit but there's an in initial one where ned goes to uh and jones in collects her they're having to go rip up the tracks and so they go to where the um they're, they're not engineers but they're in a tent city they're we're railway workers plate, 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 plate mm. yes well they, they're doing the, the railway workers and they get told well no sorry we're not qualified we can't do it. You're going to need the tools. So that it's Which like really felt big... like a public service to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, the other guy. No, that's right. And it's just bobbing them off one thing to the next. So then they go to the station master's house. Station master says, well, I actually don't have it. You're going to have to get the plate layers. And <laughs> you couldn't have written a more ridiculous story, but it actually happened. And one of my favourite things that I stumbled across was when they were in the tents, that they stumbled across the foreman, the Italian foreman, having a wonderful time with a local lass in his tent <laughs> and them shooting a, a rifle above their head and demanding that he come out and he's sort of, you know, oh my, you know, swearing in Italian at them. And I thought, man, you could not write a better thing than that <laughs> happening. It was just so funny. And, um, you know, Ann Jones coming out when he's hauled up her door, knocking on the door, you know, get out here and, you know, we're going down to the station master's house. And she says, oh, well, I just need to get dressed. And she goes and finds this red finery dress that she's, which again, actually happened. She put on her best red dress and squished herself into it, making it look, so, look beautiful and glamorous because why else wouldn't you? You've got Ned Kelly on your doorstep. You know, he's the modern day celebrity back then knocking at your door. So I love those elements of it, that the villainy aspect of it, I feel I've lost some of that perhaps um, over the time because I feel like it was coming from a place of not cold-blooded murder and the more I researched, the more those little elements of humour and, and relationship were pulled out, the, the more and more human they become. And so I don't know whether it's just because I think his Ned stands for a lot. Sometimes Ned stands for any kind of lout or idea mm. of rebellion. Um, so there's, there's elements of Ned even within the Ned myth. And, uh, yeah. But am I right in saying that there are Stringybark Creek descendants who to this day are furious that we've got the wrong end of the stick? Um, I haven't met with any Stringybark descendants, but I know that there are, um, I'm on quite a few uh, websites that are Ned Kelly enthusiasts and, and websites. Um, and there's actually, I believe, from a lot of the family of the police officers and the families of the Kellys, this coming together to work together now to, I guess, the legacy of their families together. So um, keeping the, the story that, you know, I feel like Australia feels like they own this story, but the, the families own this story as well. And so they own it together. And, and there's a lot of working together with those two sides. It's not quite as black and white as it was. So, yeah. They're not, they're not literally staring each other down to this no, day. No, no. I mean, and there's definitely, I get the feeling of disharmony amongst certain aspects of the different camps, but it's a lot more of we're working together to preserve the legacy of this story in all its, you know, humour and its terrible tragedy as well, sort of preserving that through into oncoming, yeah. especially when the myth can be taken so quickly. I mean, you can go down anywhere in Kelly's helmet any, anybody with a name Kelly can just, you know, <laughs> say they're related or, you know, the helmets are on, you know, Kelly's transports and Kelly's this and Kelly's that. So I guess it's for them maintaining maintaining that story and the truth of it, the element of truth that comes through it. Yeah. Mm. Um, Michelle, in your case, there again, there's this sort of inverted villainy yeah. that John MacArthur, again, one of my lists was duels, slanders, sharp <laughs> practices, litigation, long absences. Um, this was a bloke who, who really made a habit of trouble. He, he was always in trouble of one kind or another. And, and even to the extent that I, I had the sense from your book that the Bly mutiny was in part caused by the litigation that he was tangled up in. Mm. Um, and that perhaps Bly has had a bad reading down through history. How did we all end up getting all of this so wrong? And, and, and how did we completely miss Elizabeth, I suppose? Yeah, so John was a 
difficult man <laughs> <laughs> and constantly difficult and difficult to get along with and, and Elizabeth sort of mitigated some of his wilder political gaffes. Um, it's poss he had these wonderful highs where he was did some genius ideas and then some crashing lows where he was really depressed for a long time and in hindsight he was probably bipolar um, or undiagnosed obviously. At the end of his life he was um, declared insane to use the terminology of the time um, and his family um, kept him locked up, had to keep him locked up for the last couple of years of his life. So in some sense it kind of wasn't his fault. Um, but but his difficulties and, and his issues with Bly were partly because he kept trying to do the, the right thing and often did it the wrong way. Why do we remember him though and not Elizabeth? It's because he was lionised by his children. His children adored him and feared him. Um, and it's his children who started, um, even as soon as he died and certainly as soon as Elizabeth died, collecting all the papers and memorialising their parents and lionising their parents as partly to give themselves as part of their own social cachet, I guess. So Elizabeth was a Georgian, she wasn't a Victorian, but her children were very much Victorian where social standing was, was, was part of who they are. And it's her children and her grandchildren who donated the MacArthur Papers to the, to the State Library, so we've got this wonderful resource now. But they were building that mythology. Right from the beginning they were building that mythology. And of their time, we're talking between 1850 and, and the late 1800s, it was the man who, who got all the attention. They loved their mother and they didn't leave her out, um, but she was the helpmate to the man because that's the Victorian story, isn't it, that, that how this is how the situation works. In fact, Elizabeth's granddaughter, also confusingly called Elizabeth, everyone was called Elizabeth, um, her granddaughter turned out to be a gun farmer as well. Um, she had eight children and then her husband died um, when the littlest one was just a toddler and, and she was a, a, a model farmer in the Camden district and won awards for it and, and she's the one who cemented the family fortune, who, who brought it together and it has ensured that the MacArthur descendants are stonkingly wealthy even as we speak. <laughs> um, so the women in that family are highly regarded but the myth making concentrated on John MacArthur rather than Elizabeth because that's what you did in, in, in the 1800s. Um, you may sense from listening to Michelle that um, she has a wicked sense of humour and it, it's threaded through this book beautifully. And there's a couple of little examples I wanted to show you. One is actually from the historical record. Um, the other is Michelle's own work. But this is the historical record and an example of one of the fights that John got in. This is a letter from a guy called Atkins, who I think, was he the Surgeon General? I, uh, I think he was the equivalent of the Attorney General. Oh, Attorney General, right. Um, so this is from an Atkins letter to John MacArthur. Your original meanness and despicable littleness pervades your every action. It shows the cloven foot. Return to your original nothing. We know what you have been and what you are now. You have passed the Rubicon of dishonour. You are a leper in reputation. You ought to be driven from society lest you be infectious. <laughs> it's a shame he didn't say what he really thought. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other little example I wanted to show you is, as I say, is just the very, very light hand of Michelle. The evening before the trial on Sunday 24 January was a night of celebration. It was 20 years since the founding of the colony and Major Johnson, the Corps' commander in Sydney and himself a First Fleet arrival, had been granted the governor's permission to mark the occasion. The meal was an all-male affair, something for which Elizabeth was most likely grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, we, we have a very rounded picture of Elizabeth from what you've done, I think. Um, but one of the things that comes through is the enormous amount of sorrow that she dealt with, the deaths of multiple children, the departures of children back to the old country forever. Yeah. Um, the, obviously losing her husband for long periods, his infamy anyway. Um, it's one thing to say she was capable and that she was innovative and all of that, but she also had a very hard life in a lot of ways, didn't she? Yeah, so Elizabeth had nine pregnancies. Yes, think of her pelvic floor, ladies, <laughs> do your exercises. Um, nine children, seven of whom survived infancy, and of those seven, two died before, two or three died before she did. I think she lost four um, in total. Um, and so the death of a child is always wrenching. 
when her sons turned seven or eight, she had to send them off to school. There is no school of appropriate quality in Sydney at the time. So sending your son off to school means putting him on a ship and sending him back to England, which was currently at war with Europe. Um, and one of her little boys she put on a ship at age seven. Now, I've got a little boy and a little girl and they go off driving with their dad down to the shops and I think, oh, you know, I hope they come back. <laughs> and their dad's a very good driver. Um, she put him, her children on ships at seven and eight. One of them was seven. He's off on the ship by himself. She never saw him again. He grew to an adult. He became a lawyer. He died as an adult in London. She never saw him again. So how you live with that, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. When she was in her, I'm trying to think, this was in the 1820s, so by then she's in her 60s, I think it, the effects did begin to show. She became quite a recluse and she stopped socialising quite so much. That's partly because John was so embarrassing and she was quite worried about what was going on with him. But I think the impacts and, and the holding it together for all that time began to show later in, later in her life when the grief started to build up and to build up. Um, and in terms of hardship, even if she hadn't have lost the children, trying to do everything... There's, there's a famous saying that Ginger Rogers danced as well as Fred Astaire, but she did it backwards in high heels. And you'll have heard that before. And Elizabeth MacArthur's the same. She does the same work as you'd expect any well-known Australian to do. She's an Australian success story. She's doing it with small children at foot. She's doing it with multiple pregnancies. She's doing it with a legal system that is... Um, not ever in her favour as, as a woman because everything's contractually in, in, her, in her husband's name. So she's a woman, she's an Australian success story, and yet she's not a household name. Mm. It's, it's just odd to me. And that um, you were referring then to the, the sadness of losing children back to Europe. The, the enormous distance and time involved in those exchanges comes through in the book. For instance, um, John would engage in one of his terrible slanders and everyone would write to London saying, you need to drag this bloke over and put him on trial. And then the combatants would be waiting for a year for a letter to come back That's right. adjudicating. Yeah, and so they're all living with each other and, do you just wait? Yeah, it's coming, it's coming. That's right. um, and Nicole, in your book, um, your, I, I hope I'm not spoiling things by, by saying this, but <laughs> your speculation is that Ned would have gone back to Ireland. And I'm really interested in why you chose that. And again, it's, it's this sense of longing for something mm. far away in time and place. Mm. I, he did. That was where he was going. So he and Etty were heading back to Ireland. And it was, I feel like it would have been because it was untenable for him to live in Australia. He was so infamous. You know, if, if the siege had gone through, he couldn't possibly have stayed in Australia. And I love the myth. There's the myth of that Dan actually escaped and headed to Queensland and lived um, in Queensland until his dying day. And there was, right from the 1930s, this idea that, you know, Dan might have escaped the, the inn and lived there. And, um, you know, there's Ipswich, I think it is, that the man's buried. Um, and so that idea backed up by the fact that in the final, you know, to the tap between, uh, the judge and him, he said something along the lines of, uh, you don't envy the death that your your brothers had or something like that. And he said, oh, I don't know that they did actually die. There was some kind of innuendo there between the two of them that always makes me go, oh, maybe he did escape. <laughs> uh, but um, I've lost track of what you said, so that's just how I rolled. <laughs> the island going island. But, yeah, that's right. Um, he had to have, He had to have left. There was no other option. And I feel like he loved his mother dearly. I don't feel like he loved his father all that much. His father was a bit of a cad, really, and a drunk and died quite early on and left him as the man of the family. But I feel like his mother would have, you know, that idea of his mother telling him the stories of Ireland and that she didn't come out as a convict, though Red did, that she came out as a free person. But Ireland would have still held this special place in his heart and it would have been the place for them to find their, their happy ever after. I think that's the bit that intrigues me. If this is the 1870s, are these people by accident of birth actually Irishmen on Australian soil or are they already Australians? Yeah, no, I think they were Irishmen. I think they were Irishmen on Australian soil trying to forge that new identity of a new Australia is how I see it. So there was, I feel like he would, he wanted to be, and again, this is just my interpretation of it, that he wanted to be forging that new Australia. They wanted 
this idea of being equal and this idea of no class structures or less class structures, I guess, that was coming across from the old countries. And um, they were fighting against it so hard that that's where the, the tension came from. Yeah. Um, uh, now we've talked a lot and um, I feel like if, if you guys would like to have the opportunity to ask Michelle and Nicole a question or two, please do. Otherwise, I am armed with more questions. <laughs> Um, so it mightn't be a bad idea to stop me. Anyone like to ask a question? I shall proceed. This is like doing an auction where you go, okay, we've got no more bids. <laughs> the highest bidder, who has one? Oh, no, there's um, one at the back. There is? Yes, g'day. I don't need the microphone. I just, you asked before about uh, was there another fictionalised female mm -hmm. feminist perspective on the next? And we believe there is. Oh. Sister, Sister Kate. Sister Kate. Thank you. Oh, Thanks, thank you. Lisa. Is that still in print, Lisa? Do you know? Uh, it's not in the <laughs> it's live. <laughs> <laughs> I got it from the library, so I don't okay. know. Oh, no, she got it in print. And I sent it to you. Oh, no, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long gap. That's yeah. thirty years. Yeah. And the Kate Kelly book that obviously has just come out has a female author as well. Yeah. So I mean, right. it's talking around it. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Thank you. <laughs> um, anybody else? Okay, well, there's a thing I did want to ask you both because it's always worth asking people who have researched as hard as you both have. Um, what's the Australian history that really lights you up and, and where do you like to read about these things? Oh, I'll, I'll start if you like. I wrote the sort of book I like to read. Um, and, and I don't, I think um, Danielle mentioned this as well, I don't write what I know, I write towards what I want to know. Yep. Um, and so that Australian history about women and and looking at the reverse, I call it looking at the reverse of the embroidery. So you, you get a slightly different perspective and the sort of um, writing we're getting now from lots of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander writers, well Aboriginal writers more than Torres Strait mm -hmm. Islander writers, different issue, um, we're getting that reverse of the re embroidery as well. We're seeing what the colonial experiment looks like from the other side um, and what the white male colonial experiment looks like from the other side. And so that sort of history in all its senses really gets me excited and interesting and, and looking at it from from a different point of view. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, I like reading, his, historical fiction is definitely what I enjoy reading. And so for me, it's reading about people that are different, people that whose stories you might not ordinarily hear. Mm -hmm. And um, Hannah Kent jumps to mind as an author that just such beautiful language and yet gives every character for me this feeling of being this real person that you're sneaking a view through a keyhole into their life versus just talking big picture you know she gets into the nitty-gritty so i love Hannah Kent. Yeah. yeah and that sense that you've forgotten that it's a fictional construct yes. and yes. you're in the world entirely yes. in there yeah. with them yeah. Yes. yeah yeah and and i love non-fiction as a page turner so the sort of non-fiction where you think i'll just read one more chapter because it's mm -hmm. late and i've got to get up in the morning and three chapters later you're still there doing it um, and the latest one I've read that did that for me is um, a history of the Polynesian people called Sea People. Um, and it's a terrific page turner. It's so interesting. Um, and about a, a region that's our neighbour that I knew virtually nothing about. It's fantastic. Can you remember the author's name? No. I'm sure it's Nakapa. Someone will. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So we might clock off there. And um, thank you both so much, thank Michelle you. and Nicole. Thank it was a great chat. And thank you all for coming on. Thank you. And here's me with my little gift. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you. That's so oh, lovely. Thank, thank you very much. I've been watching oh, these mugs being given gorgeous. out for the whole weekend. It's got a little picture Have of my book. book. Thank you to everyone. My book. That's gorgeous. Oh, thank you. It's my favourite mug. Yeah.